Okay, 1 Kings ch uh, chapter 21. Um, it's, it's all about, I am going to make a parallel be between 1 Kings chapter 21 and uh, Acts 12, okay? Because the, the same tools sort of were used. One was for not good, and one, one was for the glory of God, okay? How many of you want to do things that brings the glory of God, the presence of God, the life that brings love, that brings grace in your life, in the life of others, okay? So here in, uh, in 1 Kings 21, it's a, this is what we have to be aware of, is that the first mention of the serpent or the, our enemy, of say, it was that he was crafty. So the Bible says that we are to know the wiles of the enemy. We ought to know what we are wrestling with so that we know how to pull down, you know, strongholds and principalities in high places. We can't be ignorant of that. That doesn't mean we see demons everywhere. It does mean that we walk by revelation and that we are not overcome, but we are overcomers. Come on. That we do not allow anything to have power over us, right? So here in this passage in 1 Kings 21, it says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And so who was Ahab married to? There you go. You know, the word, the name Naboth means fruits. That's the first word in the Hebrew that, that you know, the definition or whatever, the original meaning of it is fruits. So say with me, fruits. You know, there was Hannah who was determined not just to be blessed by her husband who was blessing her with a double portion, but she wanted to be fruitful. Okay. So I want to be fruitful. How many of you want to be fruitful? I want my kids and my grandkids or the people around me, the people that I'm discipling, the people that God has put in my, we want to be not just blessed, but we want to be a blessing and cause others to, to prosper also, to be fruitful. That's what happened with Joseph. Joseph, wherever he was, not only was he blessed because he took the right approach to this abuse and abandonment that he experienced, um, he uh, he was he was such he was so blessed and favored of the Lord that everyone around him come on it's like a 360 anointing and prosperity and blessing they were prospering also come on this is what this is what we're talking about here is that when we are in Christ we are fruitful and we want to cause others to be fruitful it's not just about me. That's why when we have you come and pray at the altar, it's not just about your needs to be met. It's also about to ask God to partner with him to bring heaven on earth, to have breakthroughs in different areas, of people's lives and all that, and including ours. Isn't that awesome? So here it is. A Naboth is a man of God. He has this land. So Ahab spoke to him saying, give me a vineyard that I may, may have it for a vegetable garden. He wants to do a vegetable garden because it is near. He wants to use what has been given to Naboth and to the, to the people of Israel as an inheritance. He wants to use it for his own benefit. He doesn't want to serve God. He doesn't want, he's serving Baal and he's serving the Jezebel's God, but he doesn't serve God. But he wants what God, the blessings and the inheritance of the Lord. There's something wrong with that, don't you think? Sometimes we want to, we want to have, to want, we want our cake and eat it too. We can't do that if we are not sowing in the right place. Don't expect the harvest of the Lord in our lives. Come on, that's what Ahab wants. Now Jezebel, he was married to this woman who was a worshiper of Baal, and Baal is basically likes covenant. He marries those, his worshipers. There was a covenant, okay? So she's, she's leading, you know, a good part of Israel into idolatry, along with Ahab, who works really well with her, okay? Where there is a Jezebel spirit, religious Jezebel political spirit, they kind of all work the same way. They want to control. The word Jezebel there means 
It is uh, without cohabitation. That means she doesn't, in, in, in this case it's a woman, it doesn't, she doesn't like to cohabitate with the presence of God, with the voice of God, with the people of God, with the prophets of God. It comes against the voice of the Lord. Have you seen that in the last three to four years and even before in our nation, in our churches, that religious spirit does not want to cohabitate. It wants to take center stage. You understand that? And it will do it in so many different ways. This whole thing of pornography, this whole thing online and the, and the media and all of that, that's where the Jezebel spirit likes to control. It likes to control so that we become like puppets in the puppeteer's hand. If you are controlling somebody, you need to repent today. You need to say, I am, whoa, I should not be controlling with threats. And if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. If you don't give me this if you don't do this if you don't give me the love no way if you are controlling someone or being controlled by someone you will be able to identify with Jezebel and Ahab right here I know this is a strong message and I only preach once twice a year on a Sunday morning so it's like hey I have to tell you what the Lord is showing me because we've got to stop being ignorant of how the devil works in our lives because we're missing out on what God is doing because we get stuck there I remember years ago, I asked God to forgive me for being a controlling mom. Yeah. I had to tell the whole church that I was controlling. That is like a few months after we come, you came here. He asked me, he told me, you have an influence on your family, and you need to stop having this anger uh, or this perfectionism and trying to control everything because it made me look better, supposedly. See? And I had to say, God, forgive me and tell the church that he was setting me free from this controlling thing, rooted in fear, but deeper yet, rooted in pride. And when, when we don't realize that we're walking pridefully and we're kind of like offended and whatnot, and we're picking up not only our offenses, but up with other people's offenses, and God is begins to resist us, come on, like he's going to resist Ahab in this text here. He starts to resist us instead of us walking in humility where we receive God's grace to be able to move forward, to be able to, to, to even face tough times. So right here, so Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard that I may have a vegetable garden because it's convenient. We like convenience. It's next to my house. I don't want to go too far to be blessed. I don't want to go too far to, to steal your, your thing. And if for it, I will give you a vineyard better than it. Or it, you know, if it seems good to you, I'll give you money for it. I'll give you what it's worth. So he's kind of like dangling a carrot right there in front of. And if Naboth had any, any financial uh, uh, lack or whatnot, it could have been very tempting. I doubt that he was. But it would have been very tempted if there was any greed in him or anything like that or any offenses in him or whatnot. Or maybe he was angry with God or whatever. He didn't like what was going on in the nation. Naboth could have easily fallen into that trap like we can fall into that trap. So right here, he's dangling this thing, but Naboth, say with me, but Naboth, put your name there, but, 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 said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Wow. He stands for it. He contends for it. He says, no, come on. Even if it sounds like a good deal, he says, no, you can't have this because that's legacy. That's inheritance. That's what belongs to the Lord, therefore belongs to his people. Come on, how many of us, we make compromises. Come on, we make compromises. We say, oh, it's not a big deal. Oh, I don't, I'm not going to be like this or like that or whatever. We make compromise, compromises. We ask our kids to do something that we are not doing or we're asking our kids to not do something that we are doing come on there's some choices that we have to make you know when it says we do not wrestle with principalities powers uh, and all that in high places the word power I, I studied it and it means choices the power of choices wow your choices will attract heaven will attract the Holy Spirit or will attract the devil 
our choices. We'll open the door to blessings or we'll open the door to, you know, destruction or whatnot. And I remember I was 21 years old. I just got married and I had Isabel and I, I, I had this understanding as ignorant as I was about the word and all of this, I had this understanding and I really believe the Lord was calling me to a life of abstaining from drinking and of course from drugs. I never took, touched drugs. Some, it's, it's a curse in my family. It's why my brother took his life. But 40 years ago, he asked me to abstain from that both my husband and I, because one day you will have kids. And I thought, if they choose to partake in that, it will not be because it was in my house. It will not be because I was doing it in private and asking them not to do it when they're 16 and 14 or whatever, whatever. I would not tempt my children to fall into that. And I kept my promise. For 40 years, I made a choice. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but the, with the power of choice that we have, that it will take us this way. And so that's why years later, right here, Bill Johnson gave me a word, and he says, because there was four years of generation of fr frustrated people in your life, in your family, four generations pass that they were supposed to live for God, and they were supposed to, they had the calling that you have, my friend, and he says, but they couldn't do it. So God took you out of your environment and he put you in a place like Las Vegas so that I would overcome and I, I'd be an affront to every curse that he is cursing my family. Come on. Do you understand that? And like he could not have put me in a worse place in a sense that every, every whatever is going on in a lot of families are here in every vice are here in Vegas. But I was able to say no to that so that my yes, come on, begin it's like this calling and, and this, this invitation to see heaven on earth in my family, in Las Vegas, and everywhere we go. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? So the power of choice, Naboth did this. So oh, I want to be an Naboth. Come on. I want to be an Naboth. So Ahab, like he's all sad and he's sullen and displeased. And because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, he says, he says, you know, I won't give you the inheritance. So Jezebel comes to him. Now, I want you to know, wherever there's a controlling uh, religious Jezebel political kind of, uh, uh, of movement, there's always Ahab's. So if you're a controlling person, you're controlling somebody. And it works for them for a while. Come on. Until there's enough pain, there won't be any change. So when there's a situation where there's somebody controlling someone's life, that's not the spirit of life. That's not the spirit of God. There's no, or vice versa. So there's always someone that will go into self-pity, self-absorb, poor me. But that's the spirit, that kind of controlling thing, that's, that's how it works. There's a partnership with me. How many of you want to partner with the Holy Spirit and not with somebody else that is not <laughs> going in the same direction? Come on, this is really important, even as moms or fathers or what, whatever, or husband or wife or friend or whatnot. Like, it's, it's really important that we do not try to control or manipulate things. Um, so here, but Jezebel said, come on, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? Because he, he wasn't eating. He went into a fake depression for this. Wow. He said to her, fake, uh, because I spoke to Naboth, you know, and, and I asked him for the land, and he didn't give it to me. So then Jezebel said to his wife, says, now you now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, and let your heart be cheerful. In other words, she's saying, arise, eat food, and let yourself be manipulated and controlled here. I'm going to take over from here. Come on, that's what she's saying. Because she's the one. She usurped the authority. She actually forges a letter in the name of Ahab. 
She wrote Ahab's name, sealed them with uh, letters, she, many letters, sealed them, and then uh, sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city of, with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with high honor among the people. So basically, proclaim a fast, that's a cry. Come on, that's a saying, that's an express. that's a prayer. She's proclaiming a fast, but she's doing it alone. She's like not gathering people to pray. She is proclaiming a fast so that her, her will be done. Jezebel is willing to, to fast for a piece of land. Do you understand how we as a church, we've got to wake up and start fasting and praying so that we can see a revival, so we can see the harvest coming in. Come on, do you understand that? So we begin to disciple people. We begin to, to appeal to heaven, to bring heaven on earth, to see breakthroughs in our lives. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Because she's willing to break up in a fast She's willing to go into a fast, she wrote, and see, and then what she does, and she pretends that she wants to honor. She has an appearance of godliness, but de denying its power. That's what it says in 2 Timothy ch chapter 3. It says, there's nine characteristics of a religious kind of Jezebel political spirit, and th that likes to go in the church. It looks like you're doing the right thing and you're serving God. But in there, it says, if you continue to practice these things, unthankfulness. This critical spirit, and we think that our opinion is so holy. we got to stop that. Unthankfulness, unholiness, like disobedience to, par to, to, to parents and love of money, lovers of money more than of God. All of that. And it says it has an appearance of godliness and, but denying its power from such, stay away from. We're talking about the church here. We expect these things in the world, but not the church. I'm talking about a continual practicing these kinds of things. If there's unthankfulness in our lives, it's dangerous. If there's a critical thing inside of us, that's dangerous. It hardens our heart and takes us more and more away from the spirit of love and of truth that the, whom the Holy Spirit is. So it says, what does she do? She takes two men, they're called scoundrels, and it means worthlessness. They take two men that they don't know who they are. They don't have an identity. They don't, they're just worthless. They're just doing things that they're good for nothing because they don't know who they are quite yet. So what does the enemy does? He, what does he do? He takes advantage of people that don't know their identity in Christ. Come on. They, he takes advantage of people that don't know that the Father in heaven is their father. Come on. He takes, a, he takes advantage of people that uh, don't that have a, a spirit of, of, of an orphan. Come on. He takes advantage of people that are offended. Oh, come on. There's an offense there. There's an offense there. You know what I did with an offense years ago? I was, I was offended, and I didn't realize it because it had been a few years that this incident had happened. And you know what the Lord said to me at one point? Because I didn't think I did anything wrong in it. That it just happened. That I was just, and then he just said, leave the altar, and I want you to meet with the, that couple. And I said, Okay. And I met with that couple. They were shocked when I asked them to forgive me for anything that I had done that was wrong. You know, I, I'm so sorry. I, obviously, this hurts you. You know, I am really, really sorry. They were a little shocked. And by the end of our conversation at lunch, they asked me to forgive them for, their, for what they were feeling, you know, bad about. And after that, the friends that they had around them started to text me saying how much they love me. They appreciated, I don't know, my humility or whatever. I, I don't know what, I can't remember the exact word they used. It was like an effect that took place. Instead of carrying offense or picking up other people's offense, we really need to clean our hearts, friends, because what happens is the enemy takes advantage of us. And he comes with a dangling carrot. 
or dangling something, and it looks good, and it sounds like maybe the Lord is blessing you or whatever. But if you have these things in your heart, you're not going to attract heaven or the things of God or the word of God, the promises of God. You're going to attract deception. So right there, scoundrels, you've got to know who you are. We've got to know who we are. So this is the fruit of Ahab and Jezebel and the fruit of Naboth right there. And what does she have to do? She has to bring false accusations. She goes, proclaim a fast, seat him in with high honor among the people. So she pretends to want to honor him and seat two men, scoundrels. She doesn't pick men and women of God. She picks scoundrels, those that don't know who they are. They're good for, not, like, they, that's what the Bible, the, the description of this is, worthlessness. She finds worthlessness, and before him to bear witness against him, you have blasphemed God and the king. Then they take him out and stone him, and he dies. And let me tell you, so then Naboth, they, they, Naboth um, ended up you know, being killed, and Ahab got what he wanted. And only when it was all over did Ahab come out of his, of his, of his pit. So let's go to Acts 12. In Acts 12, um, this is the situation in Acts 12. You're very quiet. <laughs> and this, <laughs> come on. Now about the time Herod, the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. So to give a little context here, the church is being, this is, they, they experience at least from the 12 disciples, their first martyr, which is James. It says, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread, which is the Passover. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but, say with me, but, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Wow. So let's look at this. First of all, this is the gate of persecution that they enter into. This is the first big persecution of the 12 disciples. And he stretched out his hand, it says, to harass the church. The word stretching out, stretching out of the hand there, it means to cast upon, to lay upon. Um, this was done, uh, it is to throw on or let go with, without uh, caring uh, where, uh, wherever it falls. Uh, to put on, to throw on oneself up, uh, upon. Uh, basically, Herod and all that he represented, he was throwing that into <laughs> onto uh, Peter. He did it to James, and the, the crowd was pleased, so Herod decided to do it again. And Herod means heroic. It means the external or outward appearance from a figure. I don't know if you know how he died. He looked like he was a god. He presented himself like a god, and he took the worship of the, of the people, and he was, you know, he was, uh, he died from the, what do you call it, the worms. Can you imagine? God took care of him immediately after he did this to, uh, uh, to Peter. And we're going to read some more about it. But he did not kill Peter, but the church was praying. Say with me, the church was praying. Come on. Say the, the church was praying. So right there, there's a gap between heaven and earth, of course. And God wants us to fill it with prayer. It is time for us to start waking up and understanding that only one prayer alone, it defeats a thousand, but with two, it defeats 10,000. That's God's math. Imagine when you have three and four and five and six, and you have a church that starts praying, and a church that starts you know, engaging into this, and a church that starts pro proclaiming the goodness of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord, a church that starts praying for, a ch for people that are in bondage just like Peter was. He was in chain. He was in prison. He had, he, he had like double portion of protection because they knew that they could they could see angels coming in again. God is going to release angels as we start praying more. 
I'm not talking about we got to pray for the same thing over and over again. No, we got to pray by revelation. Come on, we got to pray by the spirit of wisdom and of revelation. We govern through prayer. Come on, we appeal to heaven and we bring heaven on earth. That's what happened to Capri. And it wasn't just one person. It was several churches that were praying for Capri. Whoever had a heart for Capri, they started to pray for her anytime they would think about her. Why? Because the devil does not want Capri to live. Do we want Capri to live more than we, the devil wants Capri to live? Is there times in your life where you, somebody is in drugs and all that, but you want their deliverance much, much more than they want it for themselves? How many of you have met that? Isn't that just frustrating? But this is what God is saying. Do you want to see my glory? Yes. Then act like you do. It's not just going to fall on you. Jesus did say that we would be persecuted. He did not promise a life without persecution. In Mark 10, 35, it says, you do not know what you ask when they actually wanted to sit next to Jesus in heaven. That was James and John. He says, you don't know. Uh, are you going to drink? Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Jesus said, you will indeed Um, yes, you will drink from my cup and be baptized from my baptism. And that was James. James did right there. He was beheaded. So in 2 Corinthians 12, 10, it says, therefore, I take pleasure, Paul says, in infirmities. Say with me, in infirmities. Come on, in reproaches. In needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake, for, I, for when I'm weak, And I'm strong. I'm made strong. Wow. This is pretty amazing. Um, the word reproach there means an insolence, an affront, an injury, a mental injury. It says in, in Joshua, the Lord says, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. He says, therefore, call that place Gilgal. So that means a wheel, a rolling a dwelling where prophets came. I'm telling you, the Lord is wanting to remove reproaches that have come upon this house. So right here, when he, we, we continue to read, and when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping. Say with me, he was sleeping. He was at peace. The man was at peace. He trusted God. How many of you trust God here? That's how we can go to sleep at night. How can I trust God? But it was time for Peter to wake up a little bit, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the, guard be, the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, say with me, behold. Come on. An angel, um, an angel came and stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter. That means he just kind of touched them. He just, it was just a, a gentle striking Peter on the side and raised him up. He just woke him up. Come on, he woke him up. He says, gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. Come on, put on your garment of praise. Na, 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 na. Come on, get up, Peter. Come on, get up, Peter. For the salvation of many, I want you to get up. We're taking you out of prison. It's not time for you to die. James is gone and it was his time perhaps. But it is not your time. And while the church is praying and doing constant intercession for, come on, say with me, constant intercession for Peter. That represents the church. We have to do constant intercession for the church, for the people, for the leaders. Come on, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Come on, because we have a harvest to bring in. We are more than conquerors. So Peter is, is covered in prayer. It's time to cover each other in prayer. Come on, friends. This is what I want you to constant prayer. This is what it means. Constant prayer. It means it's from a word that means earnest prayer. It means the, the word pictures someone stretching out all they can for something. Do you remember the King Herod? 
He stretched out his hand to seize Peter. We are stretching. It's time for us to stretch. Come on, stretch. It's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require presence. It's going to require getting out of your way. It's going to require coming out of like being comfortable. It's going to require that. I want the worship team to come so it helps me to, to, to end on time, uh, which is past that time. So come on up, okay? I'm talking fast because I don't want you to be bored, first of all. But I, I, I'm trying to say everything that I have in my heart. I'm sorry. I'm not good at kind of like having it all packaged. I'm not good at it. But I want, I want you to hear what the, the Spirit of the Lord is saying. He's an, an invitation of intimate prayer, a powerful prayer that will move the heart of the Father, and that will move, that will bring revival. Smith Wigglesworth, Pasquale sent me a little text that said that he would pray hours in, 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 in tongues for hours before he would preach because the power of the Holy Spirit would be released. I'm telling you, it's time for the church, not just the pastors and the prophet or whatever to pray. It's time for the church, the body of Christ, to know who we are and start accessing the miracles and the wonders and the presence of God through prayer, prophecy, proclamation, whatever, lifting up others, come on, letting go of offenses and all that stuff. Do you understand that? The word constant means earnest, and the word pictures something stretching out all they can for something. I'm telling you, when I was doing the, the relay race of, uh, of you know, four times 100, I practiced that for five years. I would go into competition and all that all the time. I loved it. I was the starter. And let me tell you, to just start, I wasn't it, like you had to like really study that. And then so that you don't get up too quick and you don't go as fast. And then the person that had to receive the baton from me, she had to start running right before I would actually stay be there. And she had to run really fast so we wouldn't miss a beat in the speed. You understand that? We wouldn't miss anything. And I would stretch out. Say with me, stretch out. I mean, I would like this. Going fast, 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 and let's stretch on one leg. Let me tell you. So that, that we, we have this exchange that is perfect exchange. It's time for an exchange. Come on. It's time for mourning to gladness. Come on. It's time for us to go from this season that we've been in. Perhaps you've been in the pit. Perhaps you've been this or that or whatever. Or you think that your prayers are not going anywhere. It's time for us to stretch out in prayer. Come on, church. It is time for us to do that and to link with the next generation. Come on, that's the baton of the generational baton. It is time for us to lay down our lives so that the next generation can receive the inheritance of the Lord, you see, because the devil wants to steal it. The devil wants to tarnish it. The devil wants to bring discouragement, disillusionment. The devil wants to bring all kinds of stuff in our lives so that we do not taste and see that the Lord is good, so that we don't see our kids move forward. The word is related to a medical term describing the stretching of a muscle to its limit. This word is used when Jesus is in agonizing prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. How many of you are ready to pray more? How many of you are ready to see the reproach that has been put on us? And let me tell you something. Reproach means this also, a scorn. It means... A shame, a resting upon a shame and a disgrace. It means to taunt, to blaspheme, to defy, to jeopardize. But the Lord is saying, I'm removing and I'm rolling away. I'm calling you Gilgal, ICLV. I'm removing the disgrace and the shame and the reproaches that have been put upon you. I have to tell you something, friends. The day that we prayed for Mr. Trump here in 2016, a week and a half before the election, I had no idea how this was going to change. I had no idea that a simple saying yes to God would become such weird stuff in our church. And I believe there was a reproach put on us. I was not even able to 
look at the postings that were there was a million views and I wasn't even able to read more than two because it would have totally discouraged me because this is what God is calling ICLV to do to love well and honor well this is what the, the, the Lord is calling ICLV to do to walk in the spirit of wisdom and of revelation for this upcoming year this is what the, uh, the, uh, the church is, is asked to do, ICLV to do. He says, I'm going to remove the reproach and I'm going to call this Gilgal. But you've got to appeal to heaven and not to your own opinions, but really walk in wisdom and revelation, in power, in prayer, in presence, in prophecy. Come on, in praise. This is what we... And the Lord is, uh, is, is saying, there are some things you are not to share with, with people because they can't take it. So have... Whoa, wisdom. <laughs> have wisdom. Have love in your heart. The Lord is saying it is time that we stop accusing one another. And we stop judging one another and we start loving one another. And speak love, uh, 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 affirmations and, and speak truth and speak, and speak exhortation and prophecies and all of that. And pray for one another. I'm telling you. Just as Peter, the angel, was striking Peter there, the Lord is striking us, and it's a good divine strike and holy strike. It says, wake up. It is time to pray. It is time to stand. It is time to watch. It is time to not flinch and not move and not be swayed by everything that comes your way. The Lord is saying, I, have, I am going to bring revival. I am going to bring my glory. But my people shall, we are supposed to align ourselves with the heart of the Father. After that day that I prayed, we prayed, and everything that took place before that, let me tell you, there was a lot that went on. We had a stroke in my husband. We had all kinds of stuff, even the suicide of my brother. There was an affront, an assault on this house. How many of you are ready to say, you know what? I'm going to start praying, praying for the church. I'm going to start standing in a gap. Come on. I'm going to start letting go of offenses. Come on. I want you to stand to your feet. How many of you are ready to go into battle? Be filled with the Holy Spirit and use the word of the Lord. I want you to come forward. Even if it takes one minute. I know I'm later. It's okay. Listen. Jesus says, can you not tarry for one hour? Can you not tarry? Let go of fear. Some, some of you, you you're afraid. You, I don't know how to pray, whatever. It doesn't matter. Come on. Some of you need to say, I'm going to read the word instead of reading the newspaper. Well, it's not the newspaper, but listening to media more than reading the word. Come on. I, there's more. Can, there's some here you need to give your life to the Lord totally. Totally give your life to the Lord. You need to be forgiven. You need to start forgiving. You need to totally surrender your, your life, every part of your life. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to fill you and to be on fire for God. If that's the case, come up here. Come up here. Don't be afraid. Come in this river. Come in this river. There is a calling on this house to be a light in the community, to be a light in government. I'm not getting involved in politics. I'm getting involved in the things of God, in the matters, that, the things that matter to God. Come on. I want you to start praying in the spirit. Come on, I want you to start praying. This is not easy. I know I'm getting some resistance here, but it's okay. Come on, it's okay. It is not me that you resist. It's the Holy Spirit. It's, if it's fear, whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Just lift up your hands and begin to pray. Begin to ask God to help you to walk with, with the Holy Spirit. Come on, with the Holy Spirit with joy, with having the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. We just thank you, Father. We just thank you, Father. Can I have the pastors come and pray? Come and pray. The pastors, leaders, whomever, I want you to come. You should be at this altar, actually, and just crying out to God because I'm telling you, God is calling us. Oh, yes. He's calling us into this life of, of proclamation. So then they, they, then Peter was set free, as you know. He was set free. He didn't even realize it. And the angel took him out and out. And, and then he went to the house of prayer where they were praying. And Rhoda did not, did recognize 
recognize him and she went and told the team and didn't open the door quite yet and then they say oh it must be his angel they did not even believe the prayers that they were praying <laughs> come on church and then they celebrated so yes <sighs> oh yes so father i just pray right now i say if my people whom i call by my name would turn from their wicked ways or from their ways come on and repent come on i will hear from heaven come on i will hear from heaven and i will heal their land and i will heal their families and i will heal their bodies come on in jesus name yes in jesus name <sighs> yes is pasquale here is pasquale grab the microphone come on release that song you guys i know some of you have to go if you have to go that's okay yes come on yes yes Yes. A prayer. Yes. Yes. Tonight we're gonna do some more praying. Come on. Yes. Make me a house of prayer. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. If you've not been baptized by the Holy Spirit, or you, if you do not. You know, have the gift of tongues or other gifts, Make and you want that, come up here. We'll pray for you. Come on. Be Make filled. Me a house of Make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. You know, I, I feel like we need to really pray. If any of us have spoken against someone or spoken against a leader or a church or our president or anyone in leadership anywhere, I want us, everybody, I want us to raise up our, our, our hands. Everybody, doesn't matter if you did or not. And I want Pasquale to lead us into this, this prayer of repentance. Let's make room for the Holy Spirit, for his word to take root, okay? Let's go for it. Lord, I repent and renounce every other spirit and Holy Spirit fill me in Jesus' name. And I forgive everyone that has hurt me. I release them to you. And I forgive myself. Holy Spirit, fill me to overflow in the name of Jesus. Father, bless every one of them. Father, I ask that this would be a new day. This is a day of moving forward. You're, un you're unstucking your people. And Lord, I ask you just to bless them above their imagination. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name. Come on, give Lord praise. Come on. Come on. That's awesome. I, I bless you. Stay as long as you want to. We'll see you tonight. Some of you at 5 o'clock. More praying, worshiping. Awesome revelation. It's a great day. Thank you.